Hi, and welcome to the Write the Story podcast, where we divulge tips on plotting as you listen in to us outlining a short story. This episode has been brought to you by our listeners and supporters on Patreon. If you want to help bring more podcasts like this one to life, please visit www.patreon.com forward slash am writing fantasy. Hello and welcome to episode one. I'm Autumn. Before I call Jesper, let me bring you up to speed with what we have so far. So we have a short story we wanted to write, Jesper and I, and while we're discussing plotting it, we thought it'd be so cool to record a podcast of our conversations so you hear how we go about constructing and plotting the short story. So this is a behind the scenes style podcast where you will hear us as two authors working together to create a short story. So what we have so far is a a premise, and this is what is a formula we use to create a premise. It's very simple, very short, and helps you set, just start out with this little nugget of what your story is going to be about. So our premise, our formula so far goes with five elements, and it goes like this. Number one, you have a protagonist that is in number two, a situation. Number three, they have a goal number four, there's a villain, and number five, a disaster. So when you put it all together, it kind of goes like, number one, a hero who finds himself or herself stuck in number two, a situation from which he or she wants to break free by achieving number three, a goal. However, there is number four, a villain who wants to stop him or her, and a successful will cause the hero to experience number five, a disaster. So it's two sentences, but it starts out with an idea for a story that you can grow into. Oh, let's see what we've done a whole trilogy this way. So far, this is what we've made for the premise for our short story. And we've been working on this in the background, getting ready for today. The starting point is that we have Dramna and she's our protagonist. And she has number two, been forced to live a life dictated by her parents. They want her to become what is called one of Naveen's chosen, which is a form of a priestess. Number three, Dramna is born blind, and to become a priestess, she needs to undertake tasks, which for her, being blind, will be particularly dangerous. Her goal is to be anywhere but here. Number four, the villain who tries to stop her is really personified by her own insecurities. And then we have number five, the disaster. This is when she finds that the master assassin that is really a important figure in this society, Asko Tarizi, is wounded. So what we've done today to really get ready for this first episode is we expanded even on that short premise. And we've kind of added it up. So we had Dramna, number one, our protagonist. So that's, you know, we know it's about her. That's still the same. But number two, when we said she used to live a life that has been dictated by her parents, we expanded that quite a bit. So now our number two is the life she doesn't want to live, a life dictated by her parents, forcing her to become one of Naveen's chosen. She has, as dictated by tradition, sequestered herself near the shore for almost a year, listening to Naveen's words on the waters. She feels insecure and incapable. When she suddenly hears Naveen's whispers coming from the tide, she breaks down crying because she understands that this means that she needs to swim from the citadel of far-seeing to a barely seen tiny island to receive Naveen's blessing under the eight open arches that represent Naveen's tentacles. But of course, being blind, she knows, she just fully, fully believes she will never make it. This is when Ubri, a close friend of her, comes for one of his regular visits. Ubri does his best to comfort her, but it doesn't work until he thinks of an ancient myth that behind the waterfall at Winter's Keep, there is a cave which holds a bathing pool, which is supposed to have healing properties. If Dramna goes there, perhaps she can cure her blindness. She doesn't want to because believe because it's just a fairy tale and a kid story. But the next day, there's a water funeral of an old elf of Naveen's chosen. They bring the body down to the shore, and because the dead elf is one of Naveen's chosen, she is guaranteed the honorable fate of reincarnating as one of Naveen's underwater dragon children. 
One of the dragons comes to the surface and takes the body. There's great honor in this, but the elves attending the funeral are uncomfortable with the closeness of the dragon and leave soon after. It's the first time Dramna has seen, well, being blind, at least experienced one of the dragons. And thinks about swim and thinking about swimming out to this island, knowing there are dragons just beneath the surface, makes her want to go to the bathing pool at Winterkeep instead. So number three, which we've also expanded, and remember number three is a goal. So we've expanded her goal from Dramna as being born blind to and to become a priestess, she needs to undertake tasks we've added to her goal that anything beats risking her life in this situation. So it's kind of, we shortened it actually, but we really kind of emphasized how important this goal is for her. Now, number four is about the villain. And before we said the villain is really her insecurities. So here we kind of flesh that out a little bit more. So her insecurities, her the villain is she doesn't feel worthy and she doesn't feel like even becoming one of Naveen's chosen because it was forced upon her by her parents. She doesn't really believe in the bathing pool either, but anything to get away from the situation that she is forced into. And then this final premise that we've developed for today is she develops on her journey to Winter Keep, overcoming perils. And when she gets there, she finds Asko Terizi wounded. She decides to help him instead of going to the cave and makes that a firm choice. And when she is helping him, she sees, and that's in quotation marks, by the way, the water vapor and wind hits the wall of rock on the cliff that there really is actually no cave and learns that many elves have died trying to find it because of the ice that plummets down the waterfall and smashes into the boulders at the bottom. And so she sends this, saves this master assassin and saves his life. And he is impressed, of course, by her skills. She realizes that she can do more, so much more than she thought about herself when Askold says that she is more skilled than he was at her age. So she helps him back to the Citadel and he, upon her request, puts a word for, in for her to join the Assassin's Guild. Askel being Askel, nobody wants to object to this request, whether or not Dramna is blind or not. And then a final part is a reunion with Ubri back at the Citadel. And plus, Dramna's parents still want her to become one of Naveen's chosen, but she has gained the strength to now oppose them and stand up for herself. Her parents are surprised at how strong she has become and realize that they've been overprotected of her because of her blindness. So that's quite a huge setup. But again, we developed that out of just two sentences. And already we're have the beginning and the basis for a story. And so far, that is all we have done for this short story. Well, we have also built the world and we do know the character because we have been writing a trilogy set in this world and this character is one of those main characters. And this short story is sort of her origin story. So we have those little elements in place that would be important if we were starting to write from scratch. So today, Jesper and I are going to look over the seven pillars of plotting that we developed in our book, Plot Development. Plus, we're going to see if there are any weak spots in the premise that we've expanded on and built and see if we can just make it a little bit better and more cohesive. Okay, with that, I'm going to give Jesper a call. Hello? Hi, Jesper. How are you? Hey, I'm good. How are you? Yeah. Oh, good, good. It's always nice on the side of the pond. I hope things are good over there. Yeah, yeah. Just uh, busy as usual, but uh, but I'm ready to talk some story today. Awesome. Are you ready to go over the seven pillars of plotting and develop our pre premise a little bit more? Yeah, yeah. Let's see if we can. Uh, I, I'm not sure I can remember all the details anymore of what we did, so we'll need to probably take it slow here. and. Uh, <laughs> That sounds good. It's, you know, we wrote the plotting book about, what, two years ago now, before the pandemic. So that would be really good if we could go over the seven pillars to kind of figure out where we're going from here and then work a little bit more on our premise. Yeah, I actually found the, I found the book in, in my closet. <laughs> so <laughs> so uh, I have it here. And uh, I'm thinking throughout this podcast series, I can... Uh, I can look things up here and, and actually see what we wrote <laughs> to remind Excellent. ourselves as well, because it's like, let me see here. It's more than 400 pages, so I can't <laughs> remember everything that this one says. 
<laughs> no, I don't think I have that one memorized yet either. <laughs> okay. <laughs> so what are the seven pillars again? Right. So the seven pillars of story structure that we have is that we have pillar one is called the characters and pillar two is called plot posts. Pillar three is called adding subplots. And pillar four is creating awesome chapters. Pillar five is what we call the tension graph. Mm. Pillar six is deepening the plot. And pillar seven is revising opening and closing chapters. So, well, we'll have a dedicated episode for each of these pillars to go through it and develop whatever this book says we're supposed to do um, for each of them. So I don't think we need to go too into too much detail, more more than just orientate ourselves a bit about it's sort of explaining, well, the, the pillar one, the characters, is, well, that's self-explanatory. We're going to look at a bit of the characters like uh, Dramna herself, the protagonist. We have most of her already because of the other series we wrote with her. Mm-hmm. Um, but we have a couple of other characters here, like Ubri and Askel, the yes. master assassin, for example, that we haven't developed too much before. So we probably need to pay a bit of attention to those once we get to that episode. Mm-hmm. And then our uh, parents, too. I don't want them to just yeah, maybe, feel like yeah. overprotective. They should have a little something about them that makes yeah. them unique. Yeah, that's a good point. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So there's a bit char- a bit of character stuff we still need to do uh, once we get to that episode. Uh, then we have the plot posts. And the plot posts are more like, it's, how could I say it in a different wording? But it's it's like the main things that are going to happen. That's the, yeah. Those main things is what, what we call plot posts. Um, so we have some full guidance on how to do that, which we'll go through in detail in that episode. So, and well, apart from the premise, we have no idea ourselves at this point, what those (laughs) plot posts will be. So we'll see. But it's nice because the premise does actually tie into the plot posts. So we actually have, we do have them fleshed out. We just don't know what they are yet because I can't remember how they tie together, but we'll get there. Yeah. And then subplots, well, that's more of like the connecting tissue in between uh, Mm -hmm. that we need to do as well. Creating awesome chapters. uh, We have a bit of a formula again uh, for how to create chapters that works. So, Mm -hmm. yeah, we can go into much more detail about that when we get to that episode. Pillar 5 is what we call the tension graph. So the tension graph is more like a checkpoint to just double check that what we have so far at that point is that good enough is it strong enough uh, sh- do we have some weak spots that we need to improve upon so that's a, a bit of a checkpoint kind of episode once we get to pillar five and pillar six is deepening the plot so it's again it's finding some stuff that we can deepen and we again we have some checklists for that so we'll go through that once we get that far as well and then, of course, the opening and closing chapters of any story are really, really important. So yeah. we have some guidance we wrote, well, to ourselves and other author, authors in this book about how to make sure we get the strongest opening and closing chapter. So, yeah, we'll check that once we get that far as well. But I think, yeah, that that's the short summary of the seven pillars, uh, Autumn. Excellent. Great. Well, before I called you, I went over, since I knew we were recording, uh, what our premise is and the expanded one that we've created up till now. So I think everyone's up to speed and I think I'm up to speed. Hopefully you've uh, read the premise uh, recently. So we know where to start. Yes. Yes, I do. Um, but I, I don't know honestly where this conversation is going to carry us though. <laughs> so that that's the part we'll, we'll see now. Uh, but and that's the fun part, I guess, about us deciding to, record like live on tape here <laughs> our conversations about uh, uh, story development because uh, actually we haven't done this before in terms of actually recording how we do it so um, yeah people can listen into us sort of uh, what fumbling around <laughs> I, I think i call it brainstorming, <laughs> brainstorming. Oh, that's what it's called yeah yeah, that sounds better than fumbling around. We, we've we <laughs> written quite a few books per, individually and together, so I think we can kind of get through this somehow. Yeah. 
So I think the goal for today's conversation should probably be just double checking ourselves on the premise we have so far. Like, does it make sense or is there anything we need to improve upon? So yeah, I think maybe that's a we good just one. take them. I mean, the, the premise is already divided into five steps. So maybe mm-hmm. we can take them one at a time and just talk a bit about each one in turn and see if we feel like it's good enough or not. That sounds good. Well, I mean, obviously the first one's going to be pretty easy. So we already know uh, Dramna is our heroine, our protagonist. And I I think we're both in agreement that this short story is about her. We're not going to switch it suddenly to Ubri or Naveen or an entirely different character. No, I agree. So it is definitely about her. Yes. I, I still think like... I know we want to write like a regular coming to aid kind of story, uh, like straightforward kind of fantasy. So, mm-hmm. and, and, and I, yeah, we, we already talked about that. So, so that's what we're going to do, but I still, as we go through this conversation, maybe want to have in the back of our mind, like how do we make it a bit more interesting? Because, the very, very traditional, straightforward coming of age, to me, sometimes those feels a bit boring. So, <laughs> so I don't know. Let's keep it in the back of our mind as we have this conversation to just see, like, can we make it a bit more interesting than it's just very simple, straightforward, traditional fantasy story? I agree. And I also think um, something we didn't talk about before, but goes along with that is our author, our readers are mostly new adult to adult adult. So that's like, you know, late 18, 1920s to 40s and 50s are our core readers. And I don't want to change that. This story is meant for them. So I think it should have adult language, not necessarily adult situations, but I'm not right. We're not writing for a 13 year old. So no, we can keep right. that in mind that, you know, big words, um, complicated plots, or at least, you know, foreshadowing, all those things are, are totally legit. We're not writing something that's, you know, for middle grade. Right. Agree. Okay. Well, no, we always agree. That'll be something um, anyone listening in will probably, will be shocked. Somewhere in this entire series, we'll have to disagree on something just for the sake of it. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So that's that was easy. So we did, we know we have Dramna. It's about Dramna. Uh, we know mm-hmm. we're going to try to make the plot interesting, even though we're trying to keep it as a straightforward fantasy. And we know it's our readers that we're writing for are you know of the adult age so they can handle three syllable syllables in their words and um you know some foreshadowing and some fun elements that are f- good to throw in there so the next one we can look at is number two which is the situation this is where dramna finds herself at the beginning of the story and so we've talked in our premise that you know she is living a life dictated by her parents because she is blind and they are very protective of her. She is the only daughter, I think, only child, I think we had said of the family. Mm. And that's something to keep in mind. And so they have thought one of the safest, best things that she could do is become one of Naveen's chosen. And in this society, if, you know, I don't think I ever really clued readers in. They heard elf every once in a while, but Dramna is a blind elf. She's called a white elf in our world. So she is this privileged daughter of, I think, because I don't know, that's how I've always seen her parents as kind of like privileged um, upper class in the elven society. And they have this one daughter and they want her to be safe. And they think if she is a priestess to our goddess Naveen, who is this tentacle dragonish monster that lurks in the ocean if she could be one of the priestesses which they go about blessing the ships and the travelers and they have water is very sacred in this culture that this would be a fantastic role it fits the family it would keep her safe this is what she is going to do so she's forced into this lifestyle yeah so so far so good now i do have a problem here okay um because I agree with what you said, but I think the part we haven't really thought about is that 
as you said, the parents wants to keep her safe. And Dramna's main concern about becoming a priestess is that because she's blind, she has to swim to this island and basically become one of the chosen ones and so on. But she's scared of doing that because she's blind. Now, her parents want to keep her safe, would also be concerned about her having to swim to an island, being blind and be eaten by underwater dragons in the process, <laughs> right? So uh, we have a problem here. In, in, uh, that, that doesn't make logical sense that you would tell your daughter like, like, yeah, you should do this, even though you're blind and even though you're going to risk your life, but we want you to be safe. <laughs> that doesn't make any sense. <laughs> We know you can do it, but don't go do that, right? Yes. Well, I think sometimes parents aren't illogical, but I agree. Stories need to be more logical. Um, and the immediate thing that came to my mind is that they are thinking of helping her out, but haven't told her. I mean, maybe they're thinking, well, she's blind. She won't know that we've hired a boat to row alongside her or to keep an eye on her. For all we know, maybe they've been keeping an eye on her. She's on the shore we said for a year, that's part of this process is you're there for a year, listening to the waves, learning to listen for Naveen's whispers. And when you finally hear them, that is your time to go and swim to the island to get uh, the goddess's blessing. So maybe they're kind of like, they know they have a year, they know they're coming up on the end of the year. I mean, what do you think? Do they, I think they could, they could totally be like, yeah, we're going to have Ubri or someone else keep an eye on her. Well, Ubri can't, it can't be Ubri because he doesn't know. But maybe someone else in the family um, is going to keep an eye on her as she goes out. But I don't think they'd go so low as to, you know, put her in the boat and take her there. But I could see no, them tagging no. along. But what if, I mean, I, I imagine that they would, they would be bringing her food and stuff like that throughout mm -hmm. uh, this year where she's sort of secluded on the beach. So if we're saying that the parents or somebody from the family is bringing her food. They can also sort of keep an eye on her. But what if, if you're saying that they are a bit more high in society, they're more, a bit more privileged, maybe they made some agreements with, uh, with the high priestess. Like they don't really mm. want her to become a priestess, but they, it's more like maybe she needs to mature or something. So she, mm -hmm. so she, maybe they feel like she's too immature. She needs to grow up. So if we send her sit there um, on the beach, she will sort of find herself because, I mean, at least sitting on the beach there, it is sort of a sacred ritual to the to mm -hmm. these white elves. And she then they think like, okay, so she will find herself. And by the end of the year where she was supposed to swim to the island, mm -hmm. we're going to go and get her and say, you're actually not going to swim to the island. It's way too dangerous. But we, you learned a lot from this experience, and now we made some arrangement that you can come back to the Naveen's temple, and maybe she's just like a servant kind of person, you know, that she's supposed to do some rudimentary tasks that the high priestess has agreed to. So she's not going to become a priestess, but more like a helper or a cleaner or something in the temple. Uh, but... But then the the parents' hope is that she will have matured a bit and, and she can understand that, you know, that we're trying to help you. I don't know. May, maybe she's a bit spoiled ahead of this situation, you know? Ooh, I like that. I could see her, yeah, so she'd be a bit spoiled. Especially, I mean, she's just on the shore, so people are, it's not like she's really even a hardship. She doesn't even have to go get food for herself. Food is brought to her. And maybe they actually kind of don't think she'll hear Naveen's whispers. I mean, we didn't talk about that. What if there are some priestesses that, you know, some trainees that never hear Naveen on the water. And so the end of the year comes and they're like, well, what happens to the washouts? No pun intended on the water and washouts. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. If they don't hear it, then I, I just think then, then they, they can't become a chosen one. Huh? Yeah. I mean, they could, if they wanted to, they could try to swim out. But I'm thinking that it's because of you hearing her, the god is calling for you. That's how you find the island. If you swim out without hearing the god is calling for you, you will probably drown or Ooh. maybe get eaten by the underwater dragons or something. But you, Or maybe you turn around in time and swim back, but you're not going to make mm -hmm. it in any case to, right. in terms of becoming a priestess. Uh, so, yeah, I, I like the idea of... night. You know, her parents not thinking that she will ever hear Naveen at all, yeah. but it's more like they just think she needs to grow up now. So we'll put her there, bring her food for a year. 
she will sit there pondering in her life and understanding how much she actually has. And mm. then we'll make her go and work at a temple. Because even I, I'm thinking, even if it's like a servant role, I'm still thinking that it's an honorful job to have. Mm-hmm. Oh, yeah, I th- would think so. But I could see a lot of the upper class, you know, elven women would be... T- and actually, we never talked about it. I don't know if they're, if any of Naveen's chosen are men, but either or, that'd be something we should figure out. But just having a connection to the temple where you've gone through the year-long ritual and that you get to maybe take part in a couple of the sacred ceremonies every year, but you're not a full priestess. Would Even if you're sweeping out the steps, that gives you an honor that other people in the society don't have. Yeah. So I yeah okay so for that step I think that works yeah okay so I think that really works and really helps to develop um part two which is the situation so for the next one is we have three which is a goal and so this one we've talked about you know that she's born blind and that she basically um, the tasks are dangerous and her goal is to basically be anywhere but there. And basically, that's what we said in even in our developed premise is that anything beats risking her life. So that when Ubri tells her about, you know, reminds her of this children's tale about this magical healing pool of water that's at Winter Keep, which is a really long journey away and it's a difficult area. I mean, the white elves live in this icy kind of territory. Obviously, Winter Keep has been their their interior city. So when she hears that and she sees the dragon come to well, sees but feels and senses and hears the reaction of the people around her at the funeral of what this it's like when this dragon comes to claim this body that she kind of freaks out and says anything is better than risking her life. And suddenly a children's tale that involves a journey hundreds of miles across frozen territory sounds a heck of a lot better than trying to swim to an island she can't see, even though she hears Naveen's whispers. So is there more, is there something we're missing or more we could have? Yeah, I think that the question I immediately had in my mind is why doesn't she just walk away? (laughs) <laughs> you know, if she doesn't want to be there and, and everything, anything is better. I mean, on one hand, of course, you know, children will listen to their parents and, and they will do, uh, at least unless they're very misbehaving, but otherwise they will do as, <laughs> as they're told to some degree. Yes. But if you're told to sit on this beach for a year and not, not, not forgetting that this territory in which where the white elves are, it's incredibly cold. It's basically like winter... Uh, or not all the time, but it, it's cold. So, I mean, I, I can see she would go there and I can see she would sit there for a while, but I could also see her sneaking off with Ubri once in a while and going somewhere <laughs> else and, you know, going to a barn where they hide out and have something to eat and drink and whatnot. So basically like sneaking away once in a while. I can see mm-hmm. her doing that and then just making sure that she's, She's at the beats, at least when her parents come to check on her. So basically, she's like cheating, like, I, I don't care. Again, this I think this supports the being a bit immature thing. Yeah. Like, she's just doing what she wants instead. But then the other question then becomes, if, if that's the case, then the other question becomes, does she actually plan to go through with the testing? Or does she also has like a plan about, well, when the time comes... You know, maybe her she's thinking, I'll, I'll try to convince my parents not to do it, or, and if they insist, I'll run away, or some. Is that what mm-hmm. she's thinking? Well, I think she would know that there are women who don't complete the apprenticeship, and so that there would be other people before her who have are just related to the temple but never hear Naveen's voice. And so maybe she's not expecting that either. I mean, kids do often live in the moment. And so when she first starts on this year-long journey, she's like just sneaking out with Ubri. She doesn't care. And, you know, as she and maybe she has other friends too. But as her and Ubri become closer right, yeah. and closer. That works. Yeah. So it becomes so more So they serious. will develop their relationship yeah. like that because they're getting closer yeah. and closer, which is what we wanted them to do. Exactly. Um, and then at the same time, 
you know, come the end of the year, it, as we said before, I mean, if it's so that she can just say, well, I never heard uh, Naveen calling for me and therefore she failed and then she doesn't have to do the test. Mm -hmm. So so that's just her thinking, like, I'll never hear Naveen anyway. So whatever, I'll spend this year, uh, I might just sneaking off having fun with Ubri all the time anyway. And then, you know, once the year is gone, I've not heard Naveen, then I can get go go home again and then maybe my parents will stop... Uh, tormenting me about this stuff so that's probably her plan and then when she actually does she and i ween calling for her that will freak her out totally and i think i like the idea too that you know maybe it's uncomfortable being at the shore but her parents have been way overprotective and like any teenager she has she's tents gonna and be, everything yeah she's gonna Big be tent. like Big tent. I've got a tent. People are bringing me food. I'm sneaking out to parties with my friends. Yeah. yeah. Why the heck do I want to go live with my parents? I get a year that I get to goof off, and at the end of it, you know, I will have to go home. But I'll have been. I'll be a quote unquote an adult, and I'll be related to the temple. But I'm not gonna. Oh, there's no way Novian's gonna call on me. I'm a blind elf, and I think she'd be kind of secure in that, and just be having a little bit of fun, living in the moment. Yeah. That's what teenagers do. They don't care about yes, consequences. Yes, yes, yes. <laughs> I, I, yeah, I think that works much better than what we had. Yes, I think so too. It, it fleshes out what we had, like why she is still there and why she sticks to it. She's not just a good kid. She's actually a bit of a rebellious daughter and she's just kind of having fun. Yeah. Okay, great. I think that really helped develop the story and explain <laughs> some of the situation that we were just kind of taking for granted before, which is great. Yeah, and the funny thing was that when we did that premise, I didn't think there was anything wrong with it, but now it's just, <laughs> it's just better now. <laughs> it so is. That's well, good. I always think uh, I do that when I'm drawing and everything. I think if you finish something and you think it's done, it's best to walk away and wait a couple of days or for us a yeah, couple of weeks yeah. and look at it again. Because then you're like, no, that doesn't make sense. <laughs> now that I'm thinking <laughs> clearly. All right. So we're up to number four, number four which yeah. is the villain. So we've said it's the villain is basically the personification of her own insecurities. And it's really, you know, she doesn't think she's even worthy of becoming Naveen's chosen. And like we just said, she kind right. of expects at the end of the year, she's not going to hear the goddess. Her parents don't expect her to hear the goddess. No, they, they don't think the goddess is ever going to choose her because of her, not because she isn't special and a wonderful person, but she's blind and she has handicaps and everyone should just be nice to her because of that. I think that's kind of like the underlying kernel through the beginning. Yeah. And we also said that when we developed in the expanded premise, we said she also doesn't believe in the bathing pool either. But again, she is willing to go there because at the moment she thinks it's better to try that than to, you know, go back to her parents or, swim to the island and i think that might be the key that needs to be worked out is you know she has it pretty good with the tent and all that setup and now she's she experiences you know what being naveen's chosen the goddess does call to her and she also witnesses this dragon which unsettles other elves adult elves and is that enough to make her go holy crap, I'm not going back to my parents, but instead I'm running away by myself across country on this 100-mile odyssey. Yeah, I mean, the, the trigger here, is, of course, is that she hears the goddess calling for her, which mm -hmm. will definitely totally freak her out. So that is the catalyst of sort of triggering her. But the, but the question is, like, like you say, I'm, I'm trying to envision if I was like <laughs> the white elf on a beach and the... Uh, all of a sudden I heard somebody or, or I heard the goddess calling for me and I didn't expect it. I, <laughs> I was, I was, I'm trying to think if I, I, I freak out about it, I probably get scared and I think, Oh no, what is this going to mean for me? Mm -hmm. uh, because I can't swim to that Island. I can't see, I, I mean, how am I supposed to survive? And I don't probably don't want to. Mm -hmm. So, I'm trying to think, well, what would I do then? I, I mean, to, to some extent, I can see the some logic in saying, well, then I want to run away because what else am I supposed to do? Right? I mean, my parents will, if they, on, if they hear that I heard Naveen, mm -hmm. then, 
maybe I'll I'll be worried. Maybe they won't force me to it, but I would be worried that they would. Mm. But maybe my first step would yeah. be just to lie about it, just to say hey, I haven't heard anything. But <laughs> but then again, you know you've heard something, and and if you cross the guards, if if the guards are calling for, I mean, the, what we did mm. set up in the world building was that the guards are incredibly powerful, and they have a lot of influence, and and they. They're not these kind of gods who doesn't influence the physical material world. They are actually agents in the world. Mm -hmm. So this means that if you, if you cross the gods or if you on purpose, like I'm going to ignore the fact that you're calling for me, I don't think she would dare that. I think that would be way too scary. Mm -hmm. So true. what would be her option then would be to say, her first thought, I think, would be to say, I'm going to lie about it. Mm -hmm. But then she will probably think more about it and then justify or explain to herself that, well, my parents might buy that I'm lying here, or they, they might buy my lie, but the goddess won't. The goddess knows she called for me and I'm not reacting to it, which, and then she will be con concerned about what's going to be the consequences of that. Am I going to live the rest of my life, life cursed by the goddess? Mm -hmm. which is going to be a nightmare, right? So I don't <laughs> want to do that. So so I, I could sort of see her talk herself into going off on that, like, trip there mm -hmm. to that, even if she doesn't believe really that there is a pool that can heal you, but I could see herself justifying to herself well, the goddess can then see that I'm actually trying to do something so I can take the test, mm -hmm. you know? So yeah, that she's I... sort of justifying it to herself that I'm not sure this fairy tale is actually true, but if I go on it, then at least Naveen is not going to punish me because I'm trying to prepare myself for the test. And then it's a long, long trip. So maybe I will along the way you know, I'll think of something, you know, maybe I, I'll find a solution to how I'm not going to live the rest of my life being cursed or something. Yeah. I like that. I do. I like that really justifies like when, if she thinks her parents are going to force her to follow the gods, goddesses will, that would definitely make her not go there. And Ubri already knows that she's terrified and he's the one who came up with the story, but maybe I'm almost surprised. I, don't know if she would ask him to go or ask one of her friends to go with her like why she would go alone but i could also see hearing the goddess also as a catalyst to sit down and say i didn't expect this i am not ready not just because i can't see the island but she will suddenly realize i've just been here goofing off you know having fun totally not doing anything that you know a potential priestess should be doing and Naveen's calling me and this just isn't right. You know, I am not prepared. I would need another year of actually preparing for this before I go. Mm. And so, yeah, saying, hey, if I go and do this, this trial of going to try to find this, this hidden pool so it'll cure my blindness. So then I might be ready. I'll have gone basically truncated one year into this journey of a month to go and try to do this. And then I'll be ready to do the swim. I could see that being like when you're panicked, that that makes complete logical sense when you are totally freaked out of your mind. Yeah, and I I think that the the driver underneath it all should be her fear of Naveen somehow cursing her. Yeah, I like if that. If she doesn't too. do and and we need to keep that in mind for number 5 once we get to it because she's not going to go through the test. So how is she she will still all the time she will have this concern in her mind that mm -hmm. Am I going to get cursed by the gods for not following their calling here? So we just need to put that in in the back of our mind as we move into number five in, in a moment about yes. tackling that part. But, but I, I think that works. I think it works great. And I, I'm laughing at the scene in book one where she also does something and is suddenly worried about getting Naveen's wrath again in her life and i'm like oh my goodness this makes so much sense as her as an adult why she is really sensitive to naveen and ah, pissing her off i didn't even think about that isn't that it's like hey this really That's cool. works <laughs> so That's cool i didn't even think us. about that <laughs> all right yeah i think that works 
Okay, I think that's really, really bringing home the story and adding in that emotional element of, you know, what is motivating the character. And we'll talk, I know when we get to the other pillars, we'll talk about the emotional plot. And that's always been one of my favorite parts of the story is what makes the characters tick and the readers, you know, draws them in with those emotions. So that's really exciting to me. Yeah, I'm happy about it too. (laughs) All right. So the last one we have is the disaster. Yeah, Yeah. number five is the disaster. And so for this one, on the short one, we said it's like she's going to find the master assassin, Eskal Taziri. Taziri. Oh, see, I'm not. I have to learn to speak Elvin. Next language, (laughs) I swear. (laughs) Um, And then we expanded on that, that, you know, she finds him wounded and makes the choice to not go to the cave and let him and helps him so he doesn't die. And then by doing that and by really all the journey from, you know, the Citadel to Winter Keep, all that has really prepared her and helped her refine her senses. And so when she's standing there, she realizes the cave doesn't even exist. She can sense it based on the water vapor and the way the water is echoing against the rocks that there is no cave. And so she makes the right choice by saving him instead of basically probably killing herself by trying to find this. Yes. So, of course, we, I mean, we're only at the premise level here. So once we get into the later episodes of this uh, limited podcast series here, we'll need to, <laughs> we'll need to have something happening there that she's doing some things throughout her journey, of course. But also when she comes across Askel and he's injured, then there needs to be something to that so that she's sort of proving how she has matured. And But, but I, I, I don't think necessarily that's something we need to put into the premise. We're still working very, very high level here. But that's definitely something we need to flesh out in the later episodes of, of this podcast as well as we go through that. Um, I, I think our main question is, at the point where she comes across Askel and he's injured, we will be close to Winter Keep because that's where we're saying that the cave is supposed to be, mm-hmm. which is this other city far, far away. So, so she would take Askel to Winter Keep to get treatment for him, right? And she wouldn't take him all the way back to the Citadel. No, I think I agree with you there. I think she'll take him to Winter Keep, but maybe she will help. So something could happen there, couldn't there? Yeah, to keep. That's true. So it could happen in winter keep. And I also want to reflect to that often the disaster relates to the situation. So really the disaster for her is that she will fail and that she will still be blind and she will still be under her parents' control. And so those are the two choices. When she's when she chooses to save Askel, it is choosing that she might have to accept that life. Mm-hmm. And by accepting that, she also realizes her, by choosing to save him, she actually uses her senses and realizes she's so much more than she thought she was. So Askel is like a master assassin. Mm-hmm. Um, and he's injured, and she finds him injured. Um, she takes him to Winter Keep to get some medical attention or help for him. Mm-hmm. The fact that Winterkeep is inside Elven territory, and no, basically no of the other nations will go into this territory as as per our world building. It makes me think that Askel most likely somehow somebody must have double crossed him or something. Ooh. Right. I mean, I because that. why else would he be injured? He's a master assassin. So you, in combat with him, you will probably lose. <laughs> and I don't think that there's any like animal or something that could surprise him either. Mm-hmm. So he might be double crossed. I mean, we, we said that the master assassins, uh, they have this primer weapon, which is like very, very unique. Yeah. Um, it also gets primed to the individual, so you can't really steal the weapon. But we also said that there are only 12 Master Assassins. So one of them has to die before another Master Assassin can take their place. So you can't Mm -hmm. become a Master Assassin unless another one dies. So could we have 
well, I, I, I started almost thinking about the Star Wars, the Sith, you know, in the Star Wars, <laughs> where the master has to die before the apprentice can take their place and become the Sith Lord. Right. Uh, you know, could, could we have sort of like somebody who wants to become a master, but it's basically like, it's not an apprentice. It, it is probably a fully fledged assassin, but somebody mm-hmm. who works with Ascol on his missions, sort of like he is... Um, I won't, don't want to say helper because it is a fully educated and capable assassin himself, mm-hmm. this other person. But this other person wants to become a master assassin. And he double crosses Askel and tries to kill him. And his thinking is that, you know, he, he will lie about it. He will say something like, you know, something happened and Askel died, whatever he makes up as a lie. Mm-hmm. Uh, and then he's thinking, well, I've been on these many missions with the master of all masters. So obviously I'm going to be the one to take his place because I know how he works. I've learned a lot from him and so on and so on. Probably this guy is almost on master assassin level himself because he's learned so much. So he's really, really, really good. But he doesn't manage to kill Askel. And then we need to make it somehow that may he won't just believe that he killed Askel and then leave him that wouldn't make any sense as a master assassin you're gonna make sure you you actually succeeded in killing somebody but maybe he's interrupted or some he's concerned about getting seen or this because his whole plan lingers on the fact that nobody knows that he was the one who killed Askel mm-hmm. and then when he gets interrupted is also when Dramna comes so she brings him to uh, to the city to get his treatment and then this other assassin will make his second attempt Mm -hmm. to finish off Askel and then that's where Dramna saves Askel so she saves him twice basically well yeah she saves him in the sense that she she gets him into the city and and gives him some help but but she sort of really saves him in terms of because yeah that's fine bringing somebody in but but I think there's much more agency in the character if she actually does something physically mm. to stop his attacker. Yeah. And then saves him. Because then it will also make sense that Askel would actually acknowledge her afterwards, like see that she has a lot of skills because just carrying you into a healer, that's sort of like, yeah, well, are you like a master assassin potential just because you do that? You know? Right. <laughs> I agree. I think I just want the um, the turning point for her, though, I think, to be... It's almost like there's two climaxes. The turning point for her, or the beginning of the climax, is when she realizes she can sense where the cave does isn't there. So she suddenly... Beca- she finally becomes aware that she can sense things, with even though she has no sight. Yeah. But then she uses that again for a really strong, like, physical climax, almost, yeah. with defeating the other assassin who's come to see Askel right. and realizes that he's carrying something or what he's doing that everyone else sees like, oh, you know, this is your, not apprentice, but this is another assassin who's come to here to help you. And they're like, oh, we're so glad you're here. And she's like, no, there is more going on here than you realize. Yeah, or, I mean, I, I, I think, I don't think this other assassin would show he himself to people in the city because Askel will know that he was the one who tried to kill him. Mm-hmm. Uh, obviously, Askel will, wouldn't want to tell that to common people. That's sort of a, a matter within the assassin's guild. So he, he wouldn't talk mm-hmm. openly about that either. But, but of course, the assassin will know that Askel knows. So he, he won't show his face. I, I think he will, he will try to stealth his way into assassinate him. And then that's where Dramna can save him. I like that. Uh, I just, we have to keep in mind that she's not super trained. I mean, I, I, we haven't really talked about the education of elves, but we haven't made it sound like she's really trained. But No, I don't think she so, is. Especially not to defeat a master or an almost master assassin, but there should there could be a way that she senses it and stops it. We'll have to figure yeah, that so out. We need to writing. work out, of course, a way yeah. that how is she going to beat him in, in a way that is believable. Mm-hmm. Um, and it will definitely be something to do with her senses. And maybe, I mean, the master assassin, he will see, well, there's somebody who, here who, who is blind. So why mm-hmm. am I concerned about that? But right. 
if Dramna can sense, and we also wrote in, in book one, like, or in this main series, like she, for before her inner eyes, she can basically see the world, mm-hmm. but she doesn't see the colors, but she sees everything sort of in her mind that goes on. She, she can sense the world almost like, like a bat who does echolocation, you know, kind right. of thing. She knows where things are and so on. So I could see that this master assassin would just think, oh, uh, this, uh, young elf here she's blind so i'm not even concerned about her seeing me mm-hmm. and i'm a master so i can stealth in and she won't even hear me and then mm-hmm. i can kill Askel and sneak my way out of again and she won't even know what happened right but she can see him so she she will she will act yes. and that'll take him complete by surprise even though she's not like a trained assassin but i, I can see that work uh, if you're so that surprised that somebody who's blind obviously all of a sudden acts as if she can see you and attacks you, you would be completely surprised, even if you're oh, very yeah. trained. Oh, uh, yeah, he'd be totally flo- focused on Askel and probably turn his back to her, and she would have plenty yes. of opportunity. Yes. We've already talked about she is quiet. She's an amazingly quiet girl. So, yeah, she's going to be able to sneak up on him, and even if it's as silly as hitting him on the back of the head, she's going to be able to do something. I'm sure there'll be some wrestling. It's going to be an exciting climax, but... Yeah, and Askel yeah. probably help her in the end, yeah. right? But but she can, she can wrestle him to the ground maybe or something, and then Askel helps him mm-hmm. or helps her. And between the two of them, they they can they can they can win over this guy. So I, I can see that work. I, like that. I do like that, and that does give her what it gives it a much um, a very exciting climax before the wrap up of going back to the Citadel and why they would travel together and why he would make that recommendation saying, "Yeah, oh, she's exactly. good." Yeah, that really kind exactly. of wraps up the story. I like it. Yeah. So the only thing we then need to work out is what happens upon her return. Right, but that's not really part of the premise, but it is part of the plotting. So yeah, but we we already wrote some some we stuff did. about it. Uh, because I want to go back to what we said. I don't know, like ten, fifteen minutes ago, or whatever. <laughs> but upon returning to the citadel, I, I think what we had was fine. You know, in terms mm-hmm. of her parents uh, and uh, Ubri being happy to see her again. Askel recommending her to become an assassin. Oh, I think all that is fine. But the mm-hmm. one element we need to work in there is she will still be concerned about Naveen cursing her. Yeah, and actually I had been thinking of that before. It's like, what is there any consequence? She actually ran away. Not just she heard Naveen's voice and then doesn't take that up and instead become, wants to become an assassin. How does that work? Is there any results from that? That, you know, any punishment? How does that actually happen? Yeah, unless like, I'm thinking that becoming, getting a personal recommend, recommendation from Askel and also mm-hmm. joining the Assassin's Guild, I'm thinking that is a very highly honored thing to do in the Elven Society. So in that way, I, I think from a society point of view, I, I don't think that they would hold any grudge against her. Then they'll say, okay, that was not good what you did there, but you have clearly proven yourself. So, you know, that they would, I think they would forgive her for that. Okay. But of course, I think Dramna's main concern would be Naiveen. Mm-hmm. And if I was concerned about that, I would probably go to the high priestess. Like, okay. like, like if you, you know, like in, in religion in our world, you know, you go to the priest and ask for forgiveness kind of thing. So wouldn't she do something like that? Maybe go to the high priestess and Mm -hmm. say, you know, I know I ran away. I've learned things now. I know I shouldn't have done that and ask for forgiveness. I could see that. I I think that would be a very good way of, I mean, she doesn't want to be cursed by Naveen. So she's going to have to go and say, what do I need to do? I don't want to be what a Nivine's chosen, but I heard the goddess, but I want to be um, an assassin. How do how do I make that happen without making Naveen angry? And there's, obviously the priestess will have to find a solution. Yeah, and I don't think necessarily we need to develop that last part right now, mm-hmm. but we should make a note of it so that once we get to developing the story in the later stages here, that we figure out because I don't think it should be so straightforward that yeah you're just forgiven and have fun ha- have a good life you know, as an you know assassin and and that's it uh, <laughs> that there should be something that you know happens so some sort of consequence of something. No, uh, yeah, I agree. We're because like I said, we're we, like we agreed we're writing for adults, and with adults there's consequences. So we want to 
I think we should need to get into that a little bit. That that's that's the impetus is what makes her go to Winter's Keep is that she's afraid of being cursed by Nyveen, so she's got to come back. Everything that happens on the journey and saving Askel doesn't negate that worry about pissing off a goddess. So yeah. she's going to have to figure out how to how to do that. And I think that's also a sign of her maturity is going to the high priestess, not going to her parents and having them go to the high priestess, but she will go to the high priestess and say, I shouldn't have done that. I shouldn't have run away. Yeah. This is what I want to do. This is the path of my life. How do I make that happen? She takes responsibility now and she has matured. She's acknowledging that she'd made mistakes and, and so on. And I think that that part is important. Um, and then we just need to work out what does the high priestess say? I, I think the high priestess would say that she's forgiven because of what she did and she saved mm-hmm. Askel, but maybe like <laughs> like you have to go and light uh, ten candles and say uh, what say say your prayers ten times or what but but I, <laughs> not that simple you know but but right. I, I think there should be something she has to do to uh, seek forgiveness um, I something. could also see maybe a tiny nugget of foreshadowing to the final book of our trilogy and just saying the goddess will call for you someday and you will have to oh, answer yeah, her could... then. <laughs> Yeah, we we yes, we could make it so like maybe she's she's told to go and ask Nivine for forgiveness. Maybe the mm-hmm. high priestess say you go to the beach and pray and hope Nivine will forgive you and she will spend maybe a week or something there praying and praying and praying and basically you're sort of almost giving up like I don't know the the god is not hearing me anymore. Maybe she's angry with me. I'm concerned about it. And then maybe a week later after praying she will the goddess will respond and say i will forgive you for now but you owe me and one day i'll come back to claim yeah (laughs) that'll be nice that'll be such a wrap up and that'll lead right into book one i love it that will be so nice (laughs) okay i think this is a really the good start to our story i think so too so I think it's quite fun to do like uh, live on tape conversations like (laughs) this Uh, and uh Hopefully people will will get something out of it as we are moving through this uh, limited podcast series here to uh, basically just show how you we go about creating a story. So I, I don't think a lot of the time, you know, you can read books like the ones we wrote about plot development and you can read how we go through the stages, but you never get to see the actual application of those stages. So I think that's quite fun at least it is for me so i hope it'll be for the listeners too (laughs) yeah well i think it's a ton of fun especially working with you but then also listeners i get not only to behind the scenes on how we plot but also what it's like to get to work with another author so if they're thinking about that it's another you know this is how we have it set up and how it works with us so it might give you um you know a basis that if you're thinking of working with another author what it's like to plot with them so it's a lot of fun it is, yeah. So, uh, yeah, thank you for the call today, Autumn. Uh, it's getting late on my end, so I better go and uh, get some sleep and, and hang up now. But uh, I think we can continue next time then. That sounds good. Tell the family I said hi, and I will talk to you next week. All right, will do. Thanks. Bye. Thank you for listening to Write the Story, a limited series podcast. Please consider to support. It will help us make more podcasts like this one in the future. Go to www.patreon.com forward slash amwritingfantasy.